Welcome to Leveraging Presto DB for Data Success. And uh, full disclosure, I, that's like the last time you're going to hear me say Presto DB instead of Presto. Um, I guess a, a little background on that. So Presto, the open source project was forked, gosh, a few years ago, a few years back into two separate projects and one named itself Presto SQL and the one I work on went by Presto DB and then Presto SQL changed their name to Trino so now Presto is just free to be Presto and not Presto DB. So there's a little background for you. DB is a little bit of a misnomer too um, but we'll get into that. So here's our agenda for the day. I'm thinking we'll just go over like basic 101 information on Presto, what is it, like why would you use it, what makes it cool, um, and then second half is like one step deeper. So if you already know a lot about Presto, you might be a little disappointed. <laughs> you might not learn anything today, but I hope that is not the case. Uh, I'll do my best to, to give you a good medium deep dive. So yeah, welcome, my name is Kirsten. I'm an open source software developer with the Watson Open Technologies Group at IBM. And I've only been working on Presto for a few months now, actually. Before that, I worked on a handful of other projects, so like PyTorch and a few projects in the, in the Jupyter ecosystem. So essentially, it's my job to like go into open source projects, learn a little bit, and then go out and talk about them, so it's sort of like imposter syndrome, the job. Uh, but I wish I had Yi Hong here to back me up on that. Uh, he is unfortunately in KubeCon Europe in Paris, um, but he's also been with me on Presto for the last few months and uh, works on Kubeflow and Node.js and, and things like that. So without any further ado, if we can, if my slide would advance, we can get started. So in order to like properly frame Presto, um, I like to sort of start with an overview of what the data lakehouse is because uh, Presto is often, you know, the, the one liner would be it's, you know, a technology for the open data lakehouse. And since lakehouse is somewhat of a new concept, I like to just sort of give a little background on what a lakehouse is. And to do that, we have to even go one step further back um, to talk about, you know, two other founding technologies of the lake house. So, so a data warehouse, uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar, but, you know, it's just sort of the, the first data store um, concept, stores relational data, you know, in your nice and organized rows and columns usually. Um, and, you know, it's already been transformed by the time it hits the database, so you don't have to you know, it's basically ready for analysis, like as is. Unfortunately, that also means it's not super flexible. You know, it's difficult to scale. Uh, not all data fits nicely in those rows and columns, right? So sort of as an answer to the warehouse comes along the data lake. And of course, data lake also stores data naturally. Um, but it's a little more flexible, you know, in the types of data it can store, so not just relational, but uh, semi-structured, data unstructured, anything, any kind of data you want. Um, now data in a lake is stored as is, you know, it hasn't been usually transformed by the time it hits the lake, it's just sort of thrown in there. Um, but transform, you know, transformation has to happen at some point, right? Like, analysis, that's the whole point of analysis, sort of, is to transform the data. But, you know, in a lake concept, you're worrying about that later in the processing stage. So, you know, that makes it very flexible, you know, just put whatever data you want in the lake and access it later, so very easy to scale. But, um, you know, you're going to suffer from a bit of a lack of quality control because data isn't organized all nice and neatly like it is in a warehouse. So, you know, people being greedy and wanting the best of both worlds comes along the concept of a lake house, which, you know, is a, a portmanteau between warehouse and lake, just a combination of those words. And the intent is to bring the advantages of 
you know, the data warehouse to the, the flexibility and scalability of a data lake. So, you know, you can control data. The idea is you can control data, you know, a little more effectively, like you can usually do with the warehouse as compared to a lake. Um, but you still can use, you know, object storage and data lake storage, which, you know, could be HDFS and any number of object storage options. You can also, you know, query data with SQL, usually, as you would normally do with the warehouse, but it also enables you to do, you know, some more data lake-like advanced analytics, like, you know, ML and, and AI capabilities. So how is this done? This part can be a little controversial. Uh, <laughs> there's no real agreed upon definition of what a data lake is yet, um, at least not 100%, but you're usually gonna see these three things. So you're gonna want a you know, really performant processing layer since you're dealing with a huge amount of data. It's, you know, we're, we're working at lake size here, which is often a huge volume. You also want, you know, the flexibility to query a lot of different types of underlying storage. So to do so, you are going to have to sort of separate the compute and the storage portions of your infrastructure to provide that flexibility. And then lastly, um, and I won't touch a ton on this particular bullet point uh, in this short talk, but um, usually also we're going to want something called a table format which is an additional layer of abstraction that sits in between the, the storage and compute and helps you, you know, organize your data and it also typically provides some more warehouse-like features, uh, which would be like acid transactions and indexing, caching, historical view of your data over time, things like, things that are typically associated with, you know, data governance, which a warehouse is usually superior at. So I'll mention the table format a few more times, but uh, you know, sort of high level overview here. And then an open data lake house is just a lake house built on open standards and open source technology. All right, finally, <laughs> that finally brings us to Presto. So, you know, at a, at a high level, Presto is an open source SQL query engine for the open data lake house, and it's fast, reliable, and efficient at scale. So, you know, the query engine part of this is, of course, that processing, that performant processing layer we talked about. Um, it accepts requests and executes on them in, in order to return results from whatever that underlying storage is. And it also provides you know, the separation of storage and compute that we were talking about, which we can see in the architecture diagram. So at the high level, you know, we have at the very top is like a visualization BI tool layer, reporting layer. Um, and this, you know, this is an optional layer. You, you, don't, you certainly don't have to use a, a visualization tool. Uh, you can also submit requests to the Presto cluster via, you know, there's a CLI, there's a UI, um, there's various programmatic tools to do so as well. So that's an optional layer. The cluster itself, of course, is in the center. And in this diagram, our Presto cluster only has a single coordinator and three workers, which, you know, is, is pretty small, um, not a great real world example. Um, but Presto scales really well, so you can just as easily, you know, scale up to hundreds of hundreds of nodes, um, including a multiple coordinator setup as well. Now the lower layer represents the possible connections to the underlying data, and I say connections because you know Presto doesn't actually supply any storage of its own, uh, hence why. Presto DB is a bit of a misnomer there. It's not really a database in the traditional sense of the word. So rather it uses uh, it, this concept of connectors to connect to that underlying storage. And that could be, you know, your more traditional warehouse-like storage, like MySQL, PostgreSQL, things like that. Um, but there are also connectors, of course, to your more traditional data lake storage. Um, so to connect to lake storage, which again is usually in object storage or HDFS, you'll usually connect to it um, via 
the table format specific connectors that, that Presto makes available. So having those sort of acts as like a proxy to the underlying storage, but it also provides you know, those additional features that, um, that come with adopting a table format in general. So clearly we have disaggregated the compute and storage here. We've got those first two pieces and uh, we'll get a little bit more into that in, in the second 102 portion of the, of the talk. But here are some common, some common use cases. So, you know, Presto is, is pretty flexible. It's used for a variety of different things. Dashboarding is a big one. Um, so, you know, Presto makes it possible to do real-time analytics, uh, visualize, like, basically the freshest data. And there's no need to, you know, ETL your data from one, like, dedicated storage system into a dedicated dashboarding database. Also, you know, business intelligence, it integrates with a lot of BI tools. Uh, you can do report generation, like, especially for, like, cross-functional analysis, which we'll get a little bit into the concept of federated querying in the next few slides as well. You can also do interactive exploration. Uh, this is a pretty popular one because since Presto is really, uh, Good with the SQL processing capabilities and, and the processing portion. Interactive queries are, are probably your, your most common use case here. You can explore you know, data interactively at pretty high speed. You can do batch processing, which we'll get slightly into. Uh, not my area of expertise, personally, but um, Presto does support, it, it has an integration with Spark called Presto and Spark. And it's sort of exactly what it sounds like. It's Presto's integration with Apache Spark, so you can submit uh, ANSI SQL queries to, to Spark for batch processing. And Presto also supports you know, data-driven apps, again, due to, due to how fast it is and uh, its high performance, high-speed real-time retrieval capabilities. You know, it can support data-driven apps pretty well, Uber being one of them. Speaking, speaking of Uber, um, here's like a little sampling of some of the, you know, commonly highlighted use companies that use Presto. Uh, these are definitely going to be your, your bigger ones, of course, uh, particularly Meta, who um, they have one of the, you know, the largest data lake houses in the world, and they use Presto in, you know, several different flavors. They have a you know, a few different clusters that are tuned for different use cases. Um, but yeah, Uber, ByteDance, uh, Adobe, I'm not gonna read out all the numbers, but um, yeah, glad to be supporting them. But they also, you know, s with the nature of open source, they're also re all really good at contributing back to Presto as well. And we've um, certainly benefited from that. But we will get more, I'm teasing every slide. Every slide I'm like, oh, hear more about that later. But it's true. <laughs> um, so here's just a handful of deployment options, and uh, you know the, the companies on the previous slide often use you know some combination of all of these. But you know, Presto running Presto as part of a Hadoop cluster is one option. So whether that's you know an open source um, or commercial deployment, like with you know, Cloudera or as part of Elastic MapReduce, you know, like your managed Hadoop cluster with Elastic MapReduce. You can, of course, DIY it. So, you know, run Presto and, and manage it on a handful of virtual machines or, you know, bare metal instances. Also, uh, Amazon has a serverless Presto service um, called Athena, which you may have heard about. So that's exactly what it sounds like. It's serverless Presto. And finally, you can, of course, deploy and, and manage Presto on Kubernetes, which, you know, I, as I teased, Presto is, is quite easy to scale even without the use of Kubernetes. But, um, of course, if you're using Kubernetes, that just, like, kicks it even into a higher gear with that. Um, and it's just a great option since, you know, Presto is the processing layer. We don't have to worry so much about, you know, the data, but we do want to probably make the Presto cluster itself is fault tolerant as possible. So Kubernetes is a great option for that. Okay, so here's a summary of everything I just said. And now we get to get into the 102 portion. We'll sort of see like why all of this is and uh, you know, explore some of the features a little more in depth. 
And to do so, I've created this fake company called Company J. And <laughs> bear with me here. Uh, <laughs> So Company J is trying to determine uh, the best way to manage all their data needs. And they, so they do a few different things. They're a pretty small company, uh, but they have a few different uh, HDFS clusters. And they use those for a few different types of analysis. So they do you know, some interactive analysis on this, on this data with Hive. And they also do some batch processing on it with Spark. Not only that, but they run some reports on top of a proprietary database that they built from scratch. And they query that with SQL. Well, it doesn't really matter what they query it with. They query it. Uh, and then some of this reporting that they do also requires joining data that exists in HDFS with the data in their proprietary database. So, a few issues with this setup that they're finding as they continue to grow. So first, you know, their data in general is growing in size as they grow. Hive um, is just proving to be a little too slow for the interactive analysis that they want to do. Also, uh, Company J's analysts are hired for their knowledge of SQL and not necessarily Spark SQL or HiveQL uh, or any other number of, of query languages that are out there. And it's sort of you know, non-trivial for them to have to uh, translate these queries you know, if, you, if they're doing various types of uh, analysis on the same, you know, on different clients. And they also just have to you know, debug and they waste a lot of time converting that. And then lastly, they have to maintain those data copy pipelines, those, you know, to copy the data into HDFS, they have to, you know, do some transformation and, and all that good stuff before they can run the query on, on both those data sources at once. So time is money. They're finding that they're you know, wasting a lot of time with their current setup. And now we get to follow them through their decision making process as I weave in some more information about Presto. All right. So the first thing I like to highlight, which you know, we're all at the Linux Expo. We don't really need a lecture on why open source is awesome, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Uh, so Presto is, of course, open source. It was originally created in, I think, 2012 timeframe at Meta. And once it was matured, it, they pretty much open sourced it on GitHub right away. I believe that was 2013 officially. So Presto has really been open source from the beginning. And then in 2019, was donated to the Linux Foundation. And specifically, it sits under uh, the Presto Foundation and is managed by the Presto Foundation. So as we probably all know, you know Linux Foundation projects are, are awesome because they're controlled by a, a neutral and diverse governing body. So it's not like one company or two companies have uh, you know, a monopoly over the roadmap of the project. So that's, of course, one of the benefits. The roadmap's driven by the community needs as a whole, you know, or innovation tends to happen a little more organically in this way. And, you know, innovations are, are free for everyone to both contribute and, and take advantage of, you know, they're not reserved for monetization by certain companies. Also, uh, you know, by design, an open source project is just gonna be more flexible. It's able to integrate with, with more tools since, you know, when you're looking at a closed governance project, you know, often there might be some vendor lock-in of certain features and, and things like that. Luckily, with open source, we sort of wanna integrate with the more tools, the better to integrate with, which, which we'll see some examples of with Presto. And then, of course, the community support. Um, you know, both from those that have been working and contributing back to the project since, you know, its inception. So, you know, Meta, for example, in the case of Presto. Uh, but also, you know, support from companies that are, if you're new to a project, uh, there's often going to be other companies that are likewise new to the project. Um, so, you know, you get support from, from all levels of, of uh, and all perspectives, all stages of the pipeline. All right, so Company J, 
they're looking at this list. This is, again, not really an exhaustive list, um, but a list of some, some household name companies that, that are either adopters, contributors, um, you know, foundation members of Presto. And obviously, these companies have a lot of, you know, data management experience. And yeah, Company J likes the look of it. But their open source interest goes further than that. So recall that they're a small company. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have the time to build a proprietary solution from scratch. So they do, however, they're good open source citizens. They do have the time to, to devote a few developers a few cycles a month to contribute back to Presto, which is the right thing to do. So they, they have got the time for that. Um, and not to get, if I may get a little touchy-feely here, um, Company J, their values align with the values of the Presto Foundation as well. So, you know, as I mentioned, I've worked on a few open source projects. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in Presto, I'm more an expert in open source. And uh, from my perspective, Presto actually has a really objectively great community, super helpful, um, like, very diverse and who's going to be answering your questions and, or working on a particular PR with you. Um, so they, they're backing, they back themselves up with that one. And Company J loves that. They're all about, <laughs> they're all about diversity and welcoming and being supportive. So, all right, but they're not sold yet. So let's move on to, uh, to see what else Company J is interested in about Presto. So one, this is almost sometimes like, said as an afterthought, but it's a little more important than, um, than you would think initially, but Presto is ANSI SQL compliant. So, you know, the main bonus of this is, like I sort of alert, alluded to earlier, anyone querying um, the data only has to know a single query language. So you don't have to memorize all the different dialects of SQL or, you know, whatever other query language you're using. And what this sort of translates to is Presto has this concept of like SQL on anything. So you can really simplify querying your relational data um, and also your unstructured data. You can query in like MongoDB and their NoSQL data um, and really anything, anything in between. Um, so that also applies, in fact, to this Presto and Spark that I mentioned earlier. Um, so you can run ANSI SQL queries on Spark with this Presto and Spark integration. Um, and essentially how that works is Presto's compiler and evaluator are integrated as a library with Spark and then the job sent off to Spark's RDD API to execute. Um, so basically you can do batch, process batch processing but still use your your SQL and take advantage of, of Presto's SQL optimizations. So all this to say, um, Presto supports federated querying. So you know the concept being that you can query across multiple databases, um, data sources with a single SQL statement. And we can sort of see a little more about this in the next slide. So we've seen that you know the. Storage and compute is well and decoupled. I don't think I have to continue convincing you of that. Um, but the way that that happens is using Presto's concept of connectors. Uh, that's really what does the SQL on everything part of Presto. So Presto can really connect to any data source that has an implementation of the Presto SPI whether that's you know, your traditional databases like MySQL or the data lake storage. It's the implementation of this connector that determines you know, what functionality of that native data source is available for Presto to take advantage of. And you know, this isn't limited to open source solutions. There are, um, it's perfectly possible to, to write a connector for a proprietary data source as well. Um, some of those have been contributed back to Presto, but um, plenty exist you know, within a single company's ecosystem and, and are just used by them. And you know, I've covered that you can also connect to, to various clients as well. Um, 
in addition to you know using the the CLI and the UI and and all that good stuff. Now Presto also supports the ability to do, you know have user defined functions and user defined data types. So basically, you know you can customize your ANSI SQL by simply supplying a plugin, um, and you know when Presto starts up, it'll be fully available to use. So sort of highlights that uh, that flexibility and the lots of integration options that you're going to typically have with an open source project. So specifically to connect to an underlying data source, you're going to have a file that looks something like what's in this gray box. I mean, this is a very, very simple example of a connection that's being made to a MySQL catalog. But essentially, you just add one file per catalog into a specific directory that Presto is expecting to find these properties fi property files when it starts up. And you know, clearly, you're supplying the information that a Presto node will need in order to connect to that data. So, you know, in this example, obviously, it's occurring using the JDBC protocol um, on localhost with some authentication credentials. Um, but yes, properties files, of course, can get much, much more complicated than this. Um, and they also tend to include, you know, additional options regarding, you know, preferences for how you want the data accessed and and all, all of those good things. So I won't cover all this terminology, but um, if you do end up, you know, spinning up a Presto cluster and, and giving it a spin, you might want to uh, just be advised, you know, in the data management world, there's obviously different terminology for different things, and uh, you might want to review that before you get started. <laughs> but I'll save the time in this case. All right. We're back to company J. Uh, this is the before, should look familiar. So again, we're having a few, a few issues here. We'll get a little more in depth with them. Uh, you know, analysts need to run commands on three separate clients. That, you know, is sort of a lot of duplication and, and wasted time converting queries as needed, debugging them and all that good stuff. And they saw that Intuit, uh, the company that ha owns TurboTax, uses Presto to save like thousands of hours on query conversion per year. So they, they want to do the same. But also, you know, they have to maintain those data copy pipelines, and that is pretty expensive, not just, you know, resource intensive wise, you know, engineers have to, to maintain those pipelines and re-implement them occasionally in the case of you know, API changes or system upgrades. Um, but it's also computationally expensive. So, you know, it can be hours or days it takes to copy that data into a new source before it's queryable. And, you know, while it's being copied, it's also using a lot of network bandwidth of, as well. So that's a lot of waste considering that they only run this join between these two databases every so often. And again, Hive is slow. That's the, you know, poor Hive. They get so much, so much crap for being slow, but I'm sorry, I'm also piling onto them. So they need, uh, they need a little, little bit faster uh, analytics. And they read that, you know, Meta uses, has replaced their Hive with instances of Presto and the Presto Hive connector. So they want, they want to take advantage of that too. So here's sort of the after after they decide to go with Presto. Um, and, you know, admittedly, this is not the best representation of how Presto on Spark works, uh, but it's the simplest I could get it for the purposes of this. Um, but essentially, as far as Presto on Spark goes, uh, Presto's query parser and planner is used to create an efficient query plan, enumerate the, you know, data splits and things like that, and then sent off to Spark. But with the other two data sources, it's a little bit, little bit simpler. Um, you know, so now we can use whichever Presto client we so choose to query both the Hadoop, the lake data, and using the Presto Hive connector, as well as the proprietary database that they have for which they wrote a custom Presto connector. But 
Most importantly, perhaps, is the lack of the data copy pipelines that they need to maintain. Um, so now they can do a federated query that hits both the you know, HDFS data and their proprietary data at the same time. They can join, they can do a join with a single statement, no need to you know, maintain or re-implement any, any pipelines. And we've circumvented the need to use Hive's processing engine. Um, we're still using the Hive Metastore, so Presto does access the Hive Metastore to do its query planning and then it uses the Hive connector to, to connect to HDFS under the hood. All right, last thing I will cover is just a little bit more about why Presto is considered fast, and of course this is gonna depend on, it's, it's a complicated topic, right? There's always ways to tweak any particular system to make it work for your use case, but you know, Presto's query query analysis is really the key here. So Presto is, you know, as we saw in the architecture diagram, built on a distributed uh, architecture. So it's sort of on the, you know, the massively parallel processing model. And this is what makes it possible to run uh, hundreds of concurrent queries on, you know, scale up to thousands of worker nodes. So in the bottom right of this diagram, I tried to indicate this, you know, that workers, Presto workers are working on their tasks in parallel and each uses whatever connector is relevant in order to access the underlying data source. So for a federated query, that data and that connector is going to be different um, or can be different, but that is, of course, not always the case. Presto also does as much processing as possible in memory. So, <coughs> excuse me. Workers execute their tasks in memory, but this also includes um, an in-memory streaming shuffle that occurs to exchange data between nodes. So instead of, and here I sort of tried to, in the dark blue and the light blue are the stage and tasks respectively. Um, so in between stages, rather than writing out, uh, you know, the result of that stage to disk, instead it's just streamed between nodes, at least, you know, as much as possible. So, speaking of query stages, Presto really has a very efficient uh, stage and task management process that uh, essentially starts when you, you know, when you submit your SQL string and, and an ANTLR parser on the coordinator, you know, parses that, um, converts it to an abstract syntax tree, validates it, uh, and then finally breaks it into a logical relational tree, which is the dark blue and the light blue stages and tasks, receptively, respectively. And part of this optimization also includes a lot of, you know, what would be considered query optimizations at the task level. So, you know, based on how the query is formed, Presto has several built-in um, rule-based optimizations, like, and it supports predicate pushdown and things like that. Uh, it also can do cost-based optimizations depending on the data source you're accessing, um, where it can, you know, do join reordering and, and all that good stuff. There are also a handful of caching mechanisms built in, and again, this is just gonna depend on what connector you're using and, and whether that functionality is available for the connector you're interested in, but there is a Hive Metastore cache that um, can store certain metadata for future requests, like you know partition information and things like that. There is a list file cache, um, you know, which, as you can imagine, stores uh, file paths and certain attributes on those files to avoid repeated file list operations in certain data lake storage systems. There are third-party caching options, so again, that, that extensibility of open source comes into play here. The company Aluxio has a lot of, they, they have built and contributed back a um, SDK cache that works on the Presto workers. They also have um, an, 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 another cache that can be used to, you know, do some more. It's more of a service that you can integrate with Presto. And finally, you know, as I sort of hinted at, there are also a lot of ways you can tweak 
your resource management, have you know resource groups and uh, lots of different configuration options. So depending on what your setup is, there's an option for you. And this is just a screenshot of, I wanted to call out, it, because it's sort of a, a cool feature, especially if you're new to you know, some of the, the benefits that Presto provides. So on the UI, you can access the live query plan. Um, and essentially, it, it breaks down whatever query you submit. You can see the stages that you know, it's going through and all the tasks that are part of it. And uh, it's interactive, so it, you know, it updates in real time based on what's been completed and what hasn't. Probably could have chosen a better example here that actually showed a join and some branching and some tree action. Um, but that's just an exercise for the listener. So you can go check that out. <laughs> and uh, the last thing I want to highlight in terms of you know the the processing power and the the fast processing is um, Prestissimo. So Presto is really has you know performance top of mind, really above all else. Um, so there's a lot of work currently being done on Prestissimo, uh, also called Pre Presto on Velox, and that is an implementation of Presto worker nodes in C++ rather than Java, which is the standard right now. So the, the idea being, you know, all node communication in Presto between workers and wor other workers and workers and coordinators is done via REST endpoints. So, you know, there's potentially a lot of CPU time to be saved by avoiding starting a, a JVM process on hundreds, you know, hundreds to thousands of worker nodes. So eventually, Prestissimo will be the standard that comes with, with Presto. Right now, it's still Java. But uh, yeah, there's a ton of ton of movement, especially um, contributors from Meta and Uber are working on this a lot, as well as IBM. And yeah, it's a it's a hot topic in the community right now. All right, so this is the last time you'll see Company J. They're happy now. They <laughs> they've integrated even even more tools. You know, now that they have a unified view of their data, they can connect to a visualization tool. They go with Apache Zeppelin, another open source project. Um, they also, you know, since Presto has a um, Apache Iceberg connector that's being also very popular, getting a lot of uh, contributions to it recently. They've decided to adopt Apache Iceberg as their table format, um, which really helps them manage all their data, organize it a little, a little better, and you know provide those asset transactions and governance capabilities to get a historical view of their data and all that good stuff. So, yeah, Company J has their dream Barbie data lake house, uh, and they've saved their employees a bunch of time in doing so. So one last thing I want to highlight, um, you know, Presto has a few, you know, there's of course a few ways you can, you can try it out if you're interested, but um, just for the last year, we've had an official Helm chart, so it's a little bit in its infancy. Uh, there's three deployment modes, just a single node mode where a single node is both the worker and a coordinator. Um, there's the cluster mode, which I believe is one coordinator, three workers, and then there's a high availability mode, which um, you know includes multiple multiple coordinators and a lot more in case of failure scenarios. Um, but my ask to you is, if you're interested, please check it out because um, you know we're always looking for people to raise issues, raise questions, so we can improve the documentation. Feel free to open a PR if you'd like. Um, but yeah, it's, it's new, but it's exciting, and, and we definitely want more work on that. And same with Presto overall. Um, you know, like I said, I think it's a great community, so if you've ever wanted to, if you haven't yet you know, contributed open source and you want to, Presto is a great place to start, in my humble opinion. Um, join the Slack. Uh, it's public Slack. You can ask questions there. Uh, same with, feel free to email me if you'd like or connect on LinkedIn. Um, but I will open it up for questions now. Full disclosure, I am not the expert, so I will do my best. And if I can't answer them, I will ask the Slack channel for you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes? I have a few questions. Okay. <laughs> also, I'm like a web developer who got lost, so there's 
Okay. No, not at all. That's a great question. So uh, the question was, does Presto support writes back to the databases? And that is, depends on the connector, is essentially the, the uh, answer to that. So uh, a lot of, I would say most do. So like, you know, you can write to most sources. I know for like one example I can give is if you've heard of Apache Hoodie, they're in another table format. And right now, the, you know, the connector is in, you know, it's adolescence, I would say, and you can read, but you can't write back. Um, but, you know, on the roadmap would be like, yes, that we do want to support rights for this connector. It's just not possible at the moment. Um, so it's going to depend, but I would, I believe in my experience, I've not, there's like 30 plus connectors, um, and I only really ever work on two of them. So uh, I don't know if I'm a great <laughs> resource for this, but I would say in my experience, most support writing back, most do. Okay, <laughs> that's nice of you. Yes, yep. Right. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I'm not familiar. So the question was, um, can you compare contrast between like Uzi, Airflow, um, and Presto, and, and text like that? Dremel, right. Um, I can't. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I'm familiar with Airflow, but it's one of those situations where that's like a big piece that I intend to understand more about Presto myself. Um, more like the realistic use cases of why you would choose one over the other because, you know, <laughs> at least I'm also, not only am I new to Presto, I'm sort of new to data management to begin with. Uh, most of my other work is on like applications. So, you know, it's, <sighs> I wish, that's, that's a big piece for me, essentially. I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> I, very, very similar, yeah. Um, it's, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. The question was compare between Presto and Trino. Um, so yeah, Trino is what was previously Presto SQL. Um, the, the overarching, I don't know if this is like fully agreed upon, I don't know if Trino agrees about this, um, but I would say at a high level I mean, obviously they were forked even very recently. I think it might have been like 2020 or 2021 that they were, you know, forked from the same base repository. Presto has ever so slightly more of a focus on performance and Trino has ever so slightly more focus on flexibility. Um, so like Trino's support for connectors is further along. Um, and Presto is further along with like, you know, like with all the work being done on Prestissimo um, and just, you know, top of mind, if you're submitting a PR to Presto, people will, will be questioning like, have you, have you made sure that all of this is going to, is optimized and, and things like that. Not to say that, you know, in, in Trino, they're not caring about that, but, um, but yeah, m that's my impression is, um, you know, from the last few months of what each one is good with. I mean, of course, they're, they are very similar. They're essentially at the heart of it, almost exactly the same. Yeah, 
um, the question is like how, I mean, particularly with NoSQL databases and, and maybe, you know, in certain scenarios where you want to submit a query to do something and you don't, you want to avoid like a full scan of the entire collection and things like that. So that's again like a connector specific problem that has to be solved. Um, and when it comes down to it, often the bottleneck will be in something like that, like, you know, a, a constraint on the un that the underlying data source has on how it ultimately, you know, grabs data for you. Um, so, you know, that is still a concern. Um, and it's going to, you know, again, depend on, like, some connectors have solved for certain problems like that and do some of those optimizations that ensure like, okay, well, if we can avoid doing this, we will, and we'll like slightly tweak the plan so that it avoids things like that. Um, it's not a guarantee though, you know, it's sort of going to, again, depend on whatever the implementation of that connector is because that's what's really responsible for, you know, translating between the two very different styles of, of querying. Um, so, I mean, I mean, of course, the, the connectors are implemented with that in mind and, and will do as much of that optimization as possible, but, um, you know, you will still have sort of a, a stopgap there where it's like, oh, well, but it can't do like that. You know, it'll get as close as possible, but it can't like, you know, solve for every scenario, I guess, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I, I, full disclosure, I mostly work on the iceberg connector, so, um, you know, your NoSQL and, and typical, like, warehouse structures I'm not as familiar with, but. Yeah, uh, the, so the question is, you know, like, if you're not working at maybe like a lake house scale, is Presto still going to, are you still going to see like the benefits of, of adopting it? And um, I would say yes, you know, again, it's going to depend, <laughs> that's the, the cop out answer. Um, but there are definitely companies that do that and have like rel what would be considered like relatively small databases. Um, now, like, if you had a small amount of data and it's only stored in one data source, then you're, like, you're really going to have to do a lot of benchmarking to, like, figure out, like, okay, is Presto really going to help me with this? Um, it might. It might not. Um, you know, the more data sources you add, the more relevant Presto is going to get, and also the more size, you know. I mean, to a point, it's like, of course, there are also other tools that are even better for much, much larger, you know, scale things. Um, but, you know, depends on your setup. <laughs> Is it lunchtime? <laughs> well, thank you so much. Please feel free to reach out to me. If you ask a question on Slack, I'll probably be answering. So you might see me again. <laughs> Have a good one.